All right, how are we going, mate? Oh, mate, welcome back to the Blue Sky, boys. This is uh, how it's going. Um, intentions of the day to, uh, to do a review of the brand new Hypervit Track Slash. Um, and yeah, it's gonna be awesome weather, sick conditions with the boys. David, this is David's bike, this Slash. He's on my how are we so. <laughs> He's finally on the channel. <laughs> and more than just an ass. <laughs> more than just an ass. <laughs> Insert clip. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it just absolutely started pissing down. It's super humid. We're sweating. We were already soaked and now we're getting more soaked. We're so yeah, we're going to try to film some clips in the trees. Um, GoPro's in the car. We're going to get some GoPro laps later. Hopefully. Fingers crossed we can make that happen. Hello people, welcome back to the channel for my first impressions on the all new 2024 Trek Slash. Our mate David recently picked up a Slash 8. While he was up visiting, we decided to take it out for a rip and find out what all this high pivot nonsense is about. Pinkbike just announced this bike, well, the top of the line version as their bike of the year. So similar to Finn's video on the Norco Fluid, we wanted to find out if it truly deserved that accolade. Let's crack into it. I hit my head on the tree as he went past. <laughs> when I first took a look at the Slash on Pinkbike, I thought it looked like an uglier version of the Norco Shore. But my first look in the flesh proved me very wrong. This thing is gorgeous. It has nice lines, especially the chainstay matching up with the top tube, and the thick lower seat tube slash BB area. The idler pulley and lower MRP tensioner are very well built, look very nice and are not out of place like I first thought they might seem. The contour-esque paint job is a bit on the extravagant side for Trek, but they pulled it off well, I thought. Oh, yeah. All right, small rear wheel doing well through there. <laughs> oh my god. God, this thing just feels like it has so much travel. I'll quickly run through a few of the frame details. There is decent frame storage on all frames, including the alloy models. Just don't let the stuff fall all the way down to the bottom. It's like trying to get a pick out of an acoustic guitar. I think they're there, so we're probably going to tip it fully. Yeah, tip it off. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, they're coming. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, they got him. <laughs> Trick providing. There's loads of room for a full-size drink bottle on all sizes, despite the very low standover height. There is fantastic dropper insertion. You can fit a 200mm drop post on a medium frame. And the top of the seat tube is very low, so you can get your seat more slammed than Ramon in cars. <sighs> Mama ain't seen you that low in years. The chainstay protector is actually soft, good quality, well stuck to the frame, and provides good coverage. In general, a great improvement over Trek's previous efforts. Both pulley wheels, that is the idler and the tensioner, are clearly built with quality in mind and are surprisingly quiet when pedaling, even after a fair bit of crunchy rotorua mud found its way in there. The frame needs grease around every bearing to prevent creaking, including the headset cups. This could become frustrating as the bike gets older. David's going to have to really get into all the nooks and crannies when he gets back to shut this thing up. This was the first high pivot bike that I had ridden and I noticed the rearward axle path immediately. Not so much from improved bump compliance like I had expected and hoped, but more from how the bike felt as it compressed through corners and then popped me out again. It was definitely something to get used to. The growing chainstay length combined with the slack 63.3 degree head tube angle 
made the bike very long in the corners and it gave it an explosive bucking feeling when exiting the corner. Oh, the rear wheel loves those corners. Once I got used to this, it did actually help with conserving speed. Not only does this bike come with a 170mm Fox 36 rhythm bolted to the front, but the rear boasts that same 170mm of travel. Now there are a few bikes out there that do this, like the Specialized Enduro and the Scott Ransom. However, the high pivot design already adds to the feeling of extra travel. So to design the bike with 170mm of it is a bold move. And you can definitely tell it has more than enough cushion in the rear when riding. Man, if there's one thing this bike does well, is it's eat up those compressions like nothing. I feel like I've got unlimited rear travel. This did provide some fun when it came to those moments on a trail where instead of having to squish a drop for a smooth landing, I could blindly launch it to flat and carry on like nothing had happened. Your ankles will love this bike. Oh, slippery. One of my favorite features is the progression flip chip. In the past, I've thought of these to be a bit of a gimmick, but this one really makes a difference. I was first riding the bike at 30% sag with the chip in the 20% setting and was struggling with how linear and unsupportive it felt, which added to the cornering issues I was having. Changing it trail side to the 25% progression setting added a lot more mid-stroke support and I felt like I could push against the rear end much more effectively through corners and over rough routes. Go to the design tool. I've got the weight off the bike. Oh yeah. Oh, ask the mechanic. He always knows. Wee! I mean, that's pretty good, really. Unless you're putting a high volume air shock on this bike, like a Float X2 or the new Vivid, then I would recommend everyone puts the chip in the 25% setting straight out of the box. Once I had finally dialed in the suspension settings and gotten more used to the high pivot design, I took the slash to a flow trail to try some jumps. I was pleasantly surprised with how much pop the bike had despite my initial gripes with the progression. I think the axle path also helped with this as it would tend to flick the bike up as it left the lip of the jump. The mixed wheel setup added a very playful feeling to the rear end of the bike, while the bigger front end kept me stable no matter how poorly of a job I did trying to get it sideways. For a bike that will set you back seven and a half thousand New Zealand dollars, the only thing that didn't disappoint me spec wise was the XT cassette, derailleur and shifter. They deserve to be on this bike. Unfortunately, the crank set is Dior and the brakes were non-series Shimano 6120s. These both should have been at least SLX level. The suspension spec itself also left me wanting a lot more. Up front, Trek spec a Fox 36 rhythm. That's right, not even a performance, but Fox's most entry level 36. And for the shock, a Floatex performance. No compression adjustment, just the lockout. By the way, the noise you can hear on the GoPro is the sound of a 36 rhythm deciding to play drums internally as it went down the trail. Now, I know I'm probably being a bit harsh on the spec here, but I do have a lot of experience with these components on bikes I've owned in the past. It's just a little rough to see such a nice frame come with such average bits. However, my issues with the riding characteristics likely come from a lack of experience behind the bars of a high pivot, mulleted, 170mm monster of a bike. Whoa! Oh. 
So while I'm quite let down by the overall spec of the Slash 8, looking at the 9.8 and 9.9 .9 models, although they are a lot more expensive, have specs that start to more accurately reflect the prices. Pinkbike did choose this as their bike of the year. I can see how the quality and design of the frame alone might have helped them come to this decision. To conclude my thoughts, I think it's great that Trek have decided to get a bit spicy with their bike design. In true Trek form though, this bike was good enough in pretty much every aspect, but there wasn't anything that truly blew me away. It's a decent option for someone wanting to get into some heavy enduro riding or to have some more confidence in the bike park, but taking pole position for Pink Bike's Bike of the Year is a decision I find a little surprising. Of course, I haven't had the chance to ride any of the other contenders, so you know, take that with a grain of salt. Thank you for putting up with me ramble about some mountain bike industry bullshit. The real Bike of the Year is the one in your garage right now, so if you enjoyed this video, I think you should like, subscribe, and then go for a ride. Cheers.